Welcome back to another episode of the King's Pulse podcast presented by the King's Herald. My name is Brendan Nunez. Got Bryant West back on the show, draft expert from the King's Herald. <laughs> What's going on, Brian? How you doing, man? I don't know that you are allowed to call me that. If what? I'm the draft expert, what are you? Like, I don't know. You're, you're my mentor, man. I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I will not accept a uh, draft expert. I'll, I'll accept armchair scout at the very most. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very I'm nice. doing great. You know, if we're talking, it must be, uh, it must be edging closer to the draft season. The regular season has ended for the Sacramento Kings. Um, and we're pretty far off from any movement on coaches. So it seems a really good time to jump into uh, two dudes that we'll only really get to daydream about when uh, the Kings win the lottery in a month and a half. Absolutely. Uh, we get to be stressed on, on the lottery night once again and just praying. Um, I'll say real quick at the beginning, I'm ridiculously tired right now. Had Kings beat recording, 1320 record, um, up, went on 1320 with d and KC, and then had about four or five hours of driving right before this. So I'm very tired. I do admittedly have a glass of wine right here. I'm looking forward <laughs> to doing a KP pod where I don't have to watch my mouth though. And I can just say whatever the hell I want. I love this pod for that very reason. So it's so nice <laughs> to talk to you again, man. It's been a little while. Oh, uh, well now I feel bad. I'm not, I'm not going to be, a, it's not a tipsy pod for me. No, I think we're good. All right. Well, I don't know. Talking about Jabari Smith Jr. might get you going. We're going to have to see here. A little bit. Um, the little two bit. guys we're diving into today, because we're going to do this, I think weekly is the idea. And, you know, as we do this in, in the off season, we end up building a pretty good list of guys. Uh, you know, I think it's pretty quick. You end up with 30, 40 people, and all of a sudden your your big board is is a decent length here. And we're starting at the top. We're starting with Jabari Smith Jr. from Auburn and Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga. I figured it was a perfect time to have Bryant on because we're talking about Gonzaga. Get the Gonzaga <laughs> expert on here. Uh, today's my day in the Gonzaga world. Today is your day. Um, <laughs> do you have a preference that we start with here, Bryant? Maybe we do. I'm kind of thinking Jabari because it's simpler. If you agree uh, Jabari's, Jabari's a little more straightforward in terms of uh, archetype. I don't think he's any more straightforward in um, is he who would you rather have for the Sacramento Kings? I think that's going to be the question that plagues us all the way up until the lottery gods kick us down to nine. Um, but yeah, Jabari's fine. He's my He's my favorite prospect to watch this year. All right. I am good with going with Jabari and Jabari Smith Jr. 6'10". I didn't see a listed wingspan. Um, I, I don't see one yet either. Cini. I will say it's. I would be shocked if it was a negative wingspan. Oh, it's um, <laughs> it's got to be 6'11", 7 feet. At least, yeah. yeah. Um, again, 6'10", 19 at the time of the draft, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. freshman that just played at Auburn and the numbers that he has on the year 16.9 points along with 7.4 boards two assists 1.1 steals and a block on 42 percent from the field 43 or I'm sorry 42 percent from three on 5.5 three-point attempts per game and 79.9 percent from the free throw line on 4.8 free throw attempts per game Brian, we have to start with the shooting with Jabari, right? Yes, absolutely. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Jabari is the best shooting forward. I want to even say forward that I've ever scouted. Um, and he did so while leading an SEC team in scoring and shot attempts at 18 years old. Um, don't let Moses Moody hear you. <laughs> Sorry, Moses, you ain't 6'10". Um, I mean... You look at his size, you look at that wingspan, he's got a solid frame, he's got any athleticism and quickness, he's got excellent two-way tools, like, I'm just all in on him, man. Give me an 18-year-old with that level of shot making and perimeter defensive talent and motor, and I just refuse to believe that he'll ever be disappointed with his outcome at the next level, wherever you end up drafting him. 
Yeah, so let's just start with diving into this three-point shooting a little bit. Like I said, 42% on 5.5 three-point attempts per game, which is a little less than half of his shot attempts. And that 6'10 is fully used. Again, no official Uh wingspan, but he is releasing at the top of where he potentially can reach, and nobody is possibly going to block that. He is hitting shots contested. If he's wide open, good luck. Uh, you pointed out to number a number to me that's just absurd. <laughs> open catch and shoot shots, sixty five percent shooting, one hundredth percentile in college basketball. Sixty five. Sixty five. What? And, and and let's just circle back on that whole number. Um, Forty one point four percent on all catch and shoot shots, eighty fourth percentile in college. So it's not like he's just hitting open shots. He he. I forget what the split was, but, you know, he's the number one dude in the SEC team. He's going to be covered. Teams knew that they had to cover him. So it wasn't like he was just taking open shots. But uh, if you add him to a team that already has some creators and can use him to space the floor, uh, watch out. Yeah, that sounds like a team that we might know. Um, (laughs) I can think of one. (laughs) Yeah, I can think of at least one for sure. And, I mean, that's going to be Jabari's biggest appeal. I, I And then I think it's about how much can that be used and optimized. Like, let's talk about his off-the-dribble shooting as well, because I think that it's definitely there. But to me, where I get a little skeptical here of a ceiling, because I, I love Jabari. I think he's an extremely, extremely high floor as an elite role player. But when you're talking the top of the draft, which Jabari's a guy that's in the conversation for number one, I think you need more than role player ceiling. And I think for me, where the growth would need to come, a lot of it to me, well, there's two aspects, but the first one I'll highlight is his handle. And I think that that kind of comes with like space creation. Because again, he hits very contested shots. I clipped something a while ago of like he there's just guys draped all over him and it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like think of DeMar DeRozan when he's playing the Kings and it's like I'm pretty sure Mo Harkless was right in that guy's face and it didn't matter except Jabari Smith Jr. is 6'10". Like it yeah. does not matter if people are in his face, but I just didn't see the handle that I would like. And I don't know that there were even all too many flashes that really did it for me. Um, do you think I'm underselling it or where are you at with this handle? <laughs> I don't think you're underselling the concern. I do think that worrying about his creation ability, 18 years old, is missing the forest for the trees. The the forest in this situation being his elite skill at just 18 years old. Like He could have whole highlight reels of just deep mid-range fading jumpers. He shot 40% on all shots off the dribble. It's 85th percentile in college basketball. Had 105 attempts in the mid-range on the year. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Those were shots off the dribble. Um, He can take fading shots in either direction. And like you were talking about, so many of them are tough, contested looks with multiple defenders crowding him. Uh, Again, it sticks out most in my mind is that Kentucky game. It's just dudes all only afraid of him and running at him with multiple defenders. Um, Now – I do agree with you that there's a chance he just may never have that volume at the NBA level. His dribble definitely isn't as advanced as a couple other dudes at the top of the draft um, or, you know, a traditional number one pick. Um, But he's a real weapon with the ball in his hands. And when he pulls that jab step out, you know, he's about to shoot it. Um, To me, I think the greater question mark and i know you were going to go to this so i don't feel bad to go there i think his greatest weakness on offense is his limited success and attempts around the basket um only 14.5 percent of all of his shots in the half court came within 17 feet of the basket um and i know i talked about this last time i was on the pod so forgive me if i'm repeating myself that's a concern for a dude 610 Like, that's an incredibly weird shot chart. You're telling me that a 6'10 dude's taken less than 15% of his shots at the rim in the half court. That's crazy. He still led Auburn, a number two seed in the NCAA tournament, in scoring while doing that. He did so as one of the only efficient dudes on that offense. 
And he did so because he was pretty much the only shooter in that team. So I understand where anybody's coming from worrying about his offensive ceiling. Um, he certainly doesn't have the top to bottom three level scoring that, you know, most people are going to look at and expect from a top two prospect in a class. But at the same time, to me, it's just not going to keep me from thinking that he's in, he's a top tier player in this class. Um, nobody in this class is a finished product in any way, shape or form. And if you're telling me that the number two things that Jabari needs to show next year are increased feel when it comes to attacking the basket. And that comes with, you know, real increased ability, handling the ball, dribbling the ball, attacking, um, and just showcasing the better feel for the game when it comes within the free throw line extended. I totally agree with that, but he's a dude who shows so much skill with the ball in his hands anywhere near the perimeter that I'm just not going to believe that that can't come with time. That may just be me painting a pretty picture, but um, you know, an elite shooting prospect like him doesn't come along that often. And for me to look at a 6'10 dude and say, I don't think that he can get better when he's attacking the basket, I don't know. Yeah. And I think this is probably where we just have a little bit of differences. And I don't know that I'm, like, stuck in my ways with this right now. But I'm kind of, like, you know, because if the handle cleans up. Because I think the handling and the finishing, like you said, go hand in hand. I think that if he's a better dribbler that leads to better penetration opportunities and therefore more finishes at the rim. Like he needs to clean up both, but I do think they work together there or I guess are simultaneously hurting each other. Um, If that improves, which it totally could, like this is where like I get lost on like say a Jason Tatum comp, for example, which I know is kind of a lazy comp that people throw around earlier, but like that is, it's a very bad comp. Yeah. But that's where I'm lost on the difference there, you know. Um, And the other thing, this isn't Jason Tatum, but another thing for Jabari for me is that, like, I guess I don't want to come off as, like, I feel bad about Jabari. Jabari's full stop the best Kings fit. Like, he's exactly what the Kings need. I don't want to downplay that in the slightest. I'm being critical of somebody that's being projected as potentially the number one pick, and I'm being critical with that lens of okay you have expectations of being that good these are my questions so there is you know jabari has three and d written all over him he's going to do that zero questions and he's going to do both of those at a really damn good level we'll get to defense but just want to preface the reason i'm like being a little critical and nitpicky is because it's number one pick expectations yeah i i gotta say that I've seen so many hot takes on draft Twitter recently that, you know, really? you saying I have some concerns about him as a prototypical number one pick. That's not critical. Like it's not critical to say that, you know, for a dude with so much shooting a feel and so many tricks in the mid range, like his lack of either tricks or feel when it comes to attacking the paint and, and finishing inside is concerning. Like he's a lot more bothered by physical defense in the paint. Um, and for how quick he is, he's not the most explosive leaper. Uh, he had some nice dunks here and there, but he's not a major finish to a major threat to finish at the basket in traffic. Um, you know, but he's one of it, the youngest guys in the class. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't don't want to say that he's going to wake up tomorrow and suddenly he's you know Paul George pre injury athletic. He's got to figure out avenues to score and put pressure on the rim in order to optimize his elite shooting potential. Um, so I don't I think there's a there's a fine there's a line here that I don't think you're even close to crossing between um, overthinking the best shooting big prospect we've seen in a while so yeah the other aspect to me like because again a number one guy in my mind is a potential primary option 
And I just don't know that I'm quite there with Jabari, which again, for the Kings, more than fine. You have two guys that probably function as that. Like, yeah. you have your high usage. Jabari is a dream third option. Like, yeah. absolute dream with potential to, like, create the level of a number one. Um, the other, it's like, has it, right. yes, um, to score as a number one, I should say, because my other yeah. hesitation is his passing. I don't think it's bad. I don't think he plays outside of himself or tries anything too crazy. But I also don't know that I ever was like really all that impressed by a pass or anything, you know? And I think that's partially of like, you know, defenses are really only worried about you shooting. So there's not an aspect of you driving in as much and then Mm -hmm. for, um, moving the defense that way and then making a read from there. Like, I think all three of those things do kind of all tie together, but I don't view him as like in a, an above average passer. I don't think he's somebody that tries too hard on that end in a bad way or anything like that. And sometimes I think with prospects, there's like, you're crazy for trying that, but I like that you did every once in a while. Like it's kind of a Pokuseski type thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I just wasn't all too impressed with Jabari's passing, which again, if you're talking context of the Kings, who gives a damn? You have De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis to be your initiators, but well, this is where I'm like, is Jabari running a pick and a roll? Is he initiating an offense? I'm still not sure. You'd sure hope that he could develop more than he has. I don't think it, it – it's definitely – if if the goal in modern basketball is to have as many playmakers on the court as you possibly can, it is easy to say that Jabari isn't the most proven playmaker in the top of this class. Now, I will say, I thought he got better – as the season went along, um, even in that loss to Miami in the second round, I thought that was one of his better playmaking games. Um, the old mess game at the end of the season really sticks out to me. Um, he, he has moments where um, when he's stationary and he's seeing uh, the play that they know that he knows they're running, I think he makes the right passes and, you know, Lord, help him he's 6'10 he can see over the top of dudes and can make the fine passes now do i think that i trust him in in motion when you know hey you gotta whip a a a full court pass to a dude who's suddenly open on the other corner no i don't think i'm trusting him quite there yet so i agree that is a concern but this kind of beats around a conversation i think that we're gonna end up having with both of these dudes today. I don't know that I am going to project that Jabari is a number one score. I think that he is going to be best optimized if he comes to a team that already has a top creator. Um, And when you're talking about the number one pick, I understand you want the guy. So it's a little bit of a mess there. But like we keep talking about, this Kings team already has two of those dudes. So, um, And everything's contextualized. Like I don't know. Yeah. We were talking before we press record. Like I think there's one guy to me that I'm like, maybe he can be a number one option. And I agree in this with you. Draft. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also I, – I, I just need to point this out again. His shooting efficiency is all the more impressive considering how reliant – Auburn was on his shooting. The Tigers were 49th in the nation in three-point attempts, but they were 114th in three-point makes and 274th in three-point percentage. They only had one other dude in the major rotation who shot over 36% from three. This is a team that needed Jabari to be one type of creator and to not clog the driving lanes. So... Is it impossible to me that in a year, wherever he ends up, if he goes somewhere where there's already a number one initiator, if suddenly they were like, whoa, his, 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 his vision is better, his ability at the rim is better. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely possible. Of course, that's possible for every dang person who comes into the NBA. Spacing is going to benefit every player as much as it will benefit Jabari. But, you know, this – is a messy class if you're looking for a number one dude 
And if he, no, no, I'm sorry. It's not a messy class if you're looking for a number one dude. We'll talk about him in the future. His name is Paulo Bancaro. Um, but if you're the Sacramento Kings, like I'm not going to sit here and be stressed that people are like, well, this isn't a dude that would normally go number one, number two, because both of the dudes we'll talk about today, like neither of these dudes is a lock to me to be a primary scorer, but that's just the nature of this draft. Um, and to say that Jabari or Chet Holmgren aren't worth the number one pick in this class because they don't project to be locks as top creators is, you know, a bit reductive and ignores the fact that both these dudes absolutely have elite skills in their games that are incredibly beneficial to the modern game of basketball. Totally. Totally. And again, for me, it's, it's less of like a, you know, I, I think that he can't progress in those certain areas, the finishing, the passing or the, the handle. It's more of, I didn't see enough flashes for me to be like, Oh, that will eventually come around. But if they do like Jabari is insane Um, and you know, I'm not going to bet on that outlier necessarily, but you factor that into what his potential ceiling is because, you know, if you have a clear issue, if uh, maybe is harsh wording, but like, a if, if Javari is able to look at it and it's like, if I become good at handling and penetrating, I can be one of the best players in the league. Yeah. Then like, why would he not bust his ass? to get better in that aspect. And, yeah. you know, it's not always that simple, but I see it for sure. Um, I'll say with the shooting, I don't know if there was all too much, like, movement shooting necessarily. I'm not no. – I mean, again, nitpicking his shooting is absolutely ridiculous to do. He's a freaking elite shooter. There's no taking that away from him. 6'10", a, a movement shooting is also uh, – yeah, I don't I don't know. I'm, I'm asking a lot, you know. Um, but, yes, I think that – at the basis, you have a freaking elite 6'10", three-point shooter. And elite is is very accurate. Like yes. elite, elite. What was that number? 60? 60... 65% on open catch and shoot shots. Now imagine imagine that with uh, De'Aaron Fox and Demonis Sabonis. Yes, please. I would yeah. love that. I Yeah. You mean, yeah, that instead of Chimazi Metu? Like, oh, God. <laughs> uh, no hate on Schmessy. No hate on Schmessy. No yeah. Okay, so that's the offensive end of the ball. Defensively, Bryant. You want to take the lead here? <laughs> uh, he went to Auburn. He played for <laughs> Bruce Pearl. Do you think he cares about defense? Maybe. <laughs> I've heard some of those other guys did all right. Yeah. Um, Isaac Okoro, um, Davion, by the way, one year at Auburn. I keep forgetting about that. Me too. It, you know, good for him for going to Baylor because, you know, it paid off in the end. But has there ever been a more Bruce Pearl guard than Davion? Next time you talk to him, like, just ask him off the record. Hey, why'd you leave? Because I never heard that story. Um, I haven't either. It's a good point. Yeah. You know, it, like, defensive tenacity on the perimeter is just fantastic for Jabari. At his size. He's quick. He's engaged. He guarded a wide array of players. Like he bodied up uh, Tari Eason. Um, He bodied, he went down to Jaden Shackelford of Alabama. Uh, He's truly a dangerous, big, small defender um, and was excellent at switching on the pick and rolls, containing guards, Um, quick feet, quick hands, great footwork for his size. Um, Synergy defensive numbers back this up. It notes that across all on-ball defensive situations, he held his opponents to 25.7% shooting overall, which is 95th percentile. Um, I don't normally trust synergy defensive numbers quite as much as I trust their on offensive numbers, but that's pretty cool. Spencer Lee, since it backs up the eye test. Um, I will say that I think he's much more of a perimeter defender than a traditional big defender. Um, He's a versatile perimeter defender to be sure, but I mean, I, on bigger bigs, like he better, if he's going to match up against a, a true four, it better be a four that's got like his skill set on offense and not like 
Uh, I'm trying to think of the biggest four he could probably body up. Like Julius Randle's going to push him into the dirt. But, you know, again, on defense. It's a bonus his job. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But at the same time, like the, the, the one, you know me, I'm going to probably have Jabari number one. The one thing that Chet Holmgren is going to have against him easily is that when you're talking about unicorns, Jabari Smith is an okay weak, weak side rim protector, and that might be a little generous. He is not a difference making rim protector. Yeah. So, which is something it helps. I think, like ideally, the Kings would get. But I've also said a few times, like I don't think it's necessary. If you get a good enough perimeter defense, you yeah. don't have to deal with all too many rim attempts. And Sabonis is an okay deterrer. Yeah. I don't know that he's getting blocks or anything, but more than not, I feel like he's in okay position. I was pretty yeah. impressed with what we saw from him defensively. I don't view him as a negative there. I don't know that he's a positive either. It's probably about neutral. I, I just know that there are a lot of people out there who identify rim protection as the King's number two thing that they got to solve. And I don't think that Jabari is going to be come in and suddenly average, you know, two blocks a game or anything like that. Um, who knows as he gets older and stronger, but I, I think that his best skill is perimeter defense. And, you know, if you, if you want to play big and have him play the three next to another four, I, I keep hearing these um, arguments of, well, can he slide up to, to be a small ball five? No, I don't think he can slide up to be a small ball five. I'm much more excited about the idea of him playing next to another four. Is he's going to be? He's going to have the quickness to handle most small forwards, and you know it, the floor spacing is absolutely going to be a strength of his. So I'm with you. I I love the. I mean, I think he guards two to four, and yeah. like you said, those more physical fours probably not, but there's less and less of those in the NBA. And more often than not, like, you see a physical forward. I mean, their five isn't quite as physical outside of, like, a couple teams. Like, maybe Boston or even Time Lord's not all that physical. But, yeah, I I am with you. Um, I have a comp for Jabari. Ooh, I'm excited. I kind of teased you earlier over Slack and said he's just a 6'10 Mikhail Bridges. <laughs> which is not, like... That's not a slight at all. The Kings need a Mikhail Bridges. You know what I mean? That's. Uh, I, I came up with one I like better. Oh, okay. I was gonna say you know how to get into my heart, tug at my heartstrings. I know. I thought I was like. I thought that's what I was doing, and you like clapped back with yeah. like a Mikhail wishes he could be like this. Um, well, okay. You know. You know. I love my large adult son, Mikhail Bridges. He wishes that he had been such an elite shooter at that age. But that's the only negative thing I'll ever say about. Uh, dearly beloved Mikhail Bridges. Yeah. Whoa. Well, you're talking trash on Mikhail, and then I, you might be about to talk good about a Gonzaga guy. I'm not sure what's going on on this podcast. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> Topsy turvy right now. I went with Chris Middleton. Yes. Love it. Yeah. And Chris Love Middleton it. was an All Star. What do you make it? Once or twice in his career. I think he's a fringe All Star. He's the number two. Or you want to say 2A, 2B with him and Drew Holiday on a championship team. Yeah. He's the perfect number two, number three option. Like the perfect. Yep. An elite shooter who plays his role on the defensive end. And by the way, Jabari's bigger than Chris Middleton. Maybe not as sh- strong, but Jabari's 18 and could develop into even more than what we're seeing right now. Even mm-hmm. if maybe I don't see the flashes that I would like. But to me, that's the type of player we're talking about. And the Kings very very much need that guy yeah um i really do like that call especially from a a a mid-range danger point um and like let's be real whoever fits next to Giannis should fit next to the combination of the aaron fox and demonis sabonis so um the one that i've heard a lot on twitter is Richard Lewis. Um, And I haven't always heard that as a, uh, as a praise. Um, 
which is weird because if you told me right now, hey, Jabari Smith is going to mirror Richard Lewis's career path, like that, you take that dude number one, just forget about it. Um, <laughs> our buddy uh, Chris uh, at Sports Junkie on Twitter, he he clearly made this same comp, and he's seen some people be negative about that comp. Like anybody who thinks that Richard Lewis isn't worth that kind of pick is younger than Brendan. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it, it it's I, I just was, I was on thirteen twenty earlier today, and apparently it's just all youth jokes when I go on there. <laughs> they read a lot of them. Somebody because I just moved my display. By the way, we're on YouTube. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. I, I'm not good at. It's a transition. I got so used to my normal intro that I have yet to add into the YouTube thing. Anybody wants to watch, we are on YouTube. And you can see I changed my setup. And my favorite one, one of them was Brennan's mom let him use the living room today. <laughs> uh, but I think my second favorite was that Brennan is younger than D'Lo's pants. I thought that shit was so funny. <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, that'll be the takeaway. What was, what was the one you sent me last time I was on YouTube? Somebody was like, Brian's in a witness protection program because my yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that, I'm I still was in, unpacking in my new house. Yes, yes. <laughs> There's some hilarious comments. That's a great sure. one. But yeah, I mean, like, the floor of Jabari Smith Jr. is a plus starter. Very, like, yes. right? Yes, for sure. Which so, quick recap: Jabari Smith Jr. as a prospect, Th elite three and D player, perimeter yep. defender that's versatile. I'll say two to four, elite three point shooter, and maybe there's not the flashes I would like with penetration when it comes to his handling or his finishing or or passing and creating for others. But if any of those things click, as a guy that's going to be 19 on draft day, then you're talking about an all star. Yeah. And that floor is absolutely something that the Kings need. He instantly changes what Sacramento does. Like Absolutely. If the Kings are number one and they take Jabari Smith Jr., I don't know that it's the pick I would make. I'm not going to lock into that quite yet. Maybe I will by the end of the episode. Um, but oh. <laughs> I certainly would not be I, – I would understand. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and say if, if if you made me choose right now, I'd pick Jabari Smith just because I think he changes the trajectory of this team quicker than Chet Holmgren. I think that um, is the ceiling a little lower on bo on, on as a two-way fit? Yeah, a little bit. I think that you, unless Jabari came out tomorrow and was like, hey, suddenly I'm also a – amazing uh rim protector you couldn't have made a better four for this team in a damn lab so you could not um, no well there's franz wagner so how dare you but <laughs> <laughs> well just imagine if you could have had both no comment brian god damn it <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right let's get to chet holmgren here and by the way, I have no fucking comps for Chet Holmgren. And if anybody does, please let me know because my, what the hell is going on here? My my buddy Zach Farmer, who uh, um, went to St. Mary's with me, he was uh, pretty much responsible for getting me onto the uh, St. Mary's Collegiate newspaper. So he's the reason that this whole uh, hobby path of mine started. He had me on his WCC Hoops pod today, and he said uh, – What's a comp for Chet? And I'm sitting here like, you can't make one. He's a freaking alien. Like maybe a less offensively uh, superstardom, uh, skinnier Giannis, just because like you're looking at the body here. But I mean, if anybody oh, is like, no, I, I, I don't want to make that comp. Don't hear what I didn't say there. I didn't make that comp. I'm just trying to come from a body perspective. If anybody is going to sit there and be like, no, I can come up with a comp for Chet. You guys are crazy. Go watch the first five minutes of Gonzaga play USF in the WCC tournament. The announcer I starts freaking laughing. 
He's like, and what is happening right now? He's an alien. He absolutely is an alien. It's just, it's incredible. He's one of the more unique prospects to watch in recent years. And, you know, I, I'm watching him on Gonzaga and thinking, man, is he being underutilized at Gonzaga? Like, okay, let he, me get into the basics real quick. Yeah, sorry. I'm seven foot. Me. You're good. You're good. I, I started it. Seven foot, seven five wingspan. This is Sam Vicini, very reliable. 14.1 points, 9.9 .9 rebounds, 1.9 assists, 0.8 steals, um, 3.7 blocks per game. 3.7? Uh, what the shit? 3.7 blocks per game? Wait, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? He had more blocks, 117, in this season than he had missed field goals. <laughs> and that's because his field goal percentage is 60% as well which definitely helps 39% from three on 3.3 attempts per game, 71.7% from the free throw line, 3.1 free throw attempts per game. Did I mention 3.7 blocks per game, <laughs> by the way? Um, I think this guy, we have to start on the defensive end, right? Yeah. Well, I... no, actually like, let's just get the um, skeleton out of the closet here. That dude is skin and bones. I don't give a shit. Brian. Yeah, that's the <laughs> correct answer. I am sick and tired, and I feel bad because I'm the one who wanted to get this out in the open first. I'm sick and tired of everything about the most unique two-way dude in a while being reduced to, well, yeah, I was going to handle uh, NBA players in the post. Whatever, man. Did you watch him in college? When he played uh, Jalen Duran, and Duran scored five points, by the way, but everybody decided to clip the one time the that Duran actually got him in the post. And not, not like the, the possession before where he blocked him. Well, or the possession on the other end where he just like bodied him out of the paint. Like there were so many times in college, the Duke game was a, a great one where Paulo Bancaro had quite a few buckets against him. Chet Holmgren also stopped him on quite a few buckets. Like, none of these dudes are finished products. And latching on to the most obvious thing and just hammering it home is reductive when it's ignoring everything else about his game. He is absolutely the most physical big man that I have seen in a while. Oof. Okay. I see it. I see it. Um, he's got, for context, like, Evan Mobley has 15 pounds on him when Evan Mobley's at USC. Yeah. And Evan Mobley was understandably called thin. Like, I'm not trying to undersell that Chet's not thin or nothing. It just doesn't concern me. His length is ridiculous, and he uses it like crazy. He could get pushed back a couple inches when somebody's posting him up. His hands are still going to be in the way. Yeah. It does not matter. Like, I'm very much subscribing to his length makes it not matter because also, like you said, he's very physical. He doesn't shy away from any physicality. I think he has good timings where you see him maybe like slithering around guys, but that's all strategic. It's not because he doesn't want to deal with physicality or anything like this. Like, he very much is okay with that. Um, I have... I think we're on the same page. Like, well, and and it's not just his length. Like, it's his quickness too. It's his coordination. A dude that big, aside from Evan Mobley, like, it, I just haven't seen dudes be able to move like that at that size. And will some of that be reined in a bit as he adds more bulk? Probably. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be a uh, professional weight trainer and have any idea how much strength he can add and what his final, you know, perfect balance between strength and quickness is going to be. But his coordination is just stupid for a guy that long. Yeah. I think where it hurts, if, if you want to call it that, because he makes up for it in other aspects, but like he's not defending the biggest centers in the post. He, he's, Joel Embiid is going to do whatever he wants against Chet Holmgren in the post. That's fine. Yeah. 
Like he shouldn't be guarding Joel Embiid. No. Like if you want to talk Kings context, have Demontis Sabonis be the guy that is trying to not give up that much ground, and then Chet Holmgren comes over and helps and swallows him up. Um, is Chet the best defensive prospect that you've watched, or In this year? Yes. Can we can we go back a while? Like uh, Evan Mobley is Evan Mobley is a better defensive prospect. Like I just talked about how great Chet is in terms of quickness and, and uh, fluidity. Like I'm not going to sit here and pretend that he's going to be as great a perimeter switchable space defender as Evan is. Now that's not saying much because Evan Mobley was the best defensive prospect I'd ever seen in my goddamn life. Yeah. But rim protection, you know, rim protection. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like it, it's he, fun. it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and it was um, ridiculous all season long. It was ridiculous when they were playing uh, top flight out of conference teams. It was ridiculous when they were playing freaking San Diego. It doesn't matter. He wasn't a dude. His his scoring definitely went up and down a tiny bit when we're talking about difference between uh, real strong opponents and the bottom of the WCC. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that the bottom of the WCC isn't bad. WCC as a conference had its best year in a long time, and anybody who wants to ding him just for the conference uh, needs to go back and watch some more tape. But his rim protection did not fluctuate. He was always on point. Um, Gonzaga doesn't get anywhere close to as far as they did this year without his rim protection. That team had two really good defenders on that team, him and Rasheer Bolton. So yeah. he made it work. And pick and roll defense is where it's really crazy. You know, and, and this is where I want to okay, I, I guess before we get into Sacramento fit defensively. I have a Chet, whole bunch of defensive numbers. Okay. Chet is not a great perimeter defender, like you talked about. I don't think he's bad. I, I don't think I, I, I think he's great. I think he's great. I won't so, say that he is I won't what say I'll, what I'll say, say is I think he gets moment. I think he gets beat, but it doesn't matter because of his length again. He doesn't get beat so bad that he's completely in the dust. He's just kind of on the guy's hip, which normally for a normal human being, that's enough. For seven foot, seven five wingspan, Chet Holmgren that has great body control, he's like recovering. That's good time. defense for him. Yeah. He, that's, it, he probably let some dudes get by him because he knows I'm just going to block you in a second anyway. Which typically is like, if I see that in a prospect, I'm like, oh, well, that's just poor discipline. You're letting yourself just get away with things because you're more athletic and just bigger and better. You're not going to be able to get with, away with that in the NBA. No, like, Chet is, I I believe it with Chet at the NBA level. Yeah. Um, um, around the basket. What do you want to highlight? Around the basket, non-post-up situations. Chet and Holmgren held good dudes to 28.6% shooting. Opponents shot 31% against him in isolation. Pick and roll defense, phenomenal at the college level. When he covered the roll man in the pick and roll, he held them to three of 20 shooting. So all of that's going to be a little less impressive when it comes to NBA defenders. But so what? Yeah, He's still the best defensive prospect in this class by far. Yeah. Drop coverage, he's phenomenal. Like, he's cerebral. He's yeah. so good. It's it's Mobley stuff of just perfectly being in between the aspect where the roll man's not getting behind him, but he's also containing the guard at the same time. He's interrupting the passes between the two and just somehow guarding two people at once. And that's just something only this seven foot, seven five guy is capable of doing. Uh seven foot, seven five wingspan guy is capable of doing. Question for you when we're talking about some of these numbers. How do you gauge the whole He's playing against the WCC. He's playing um, against teams like St. Mary's. I don't know how to feel about <laughs> this. <laughs> Which is funny because, you know, had two of his worst games came against uh, St. Mary's. <laughs> Randy Bennett's a genius. I'll just say that. Um, no, I'm not I'm not kidding. Matthias uh, Toss had quite a few good possessions against him on both ends. Um, you're going to be able to find clips 
where even the lower competition beats him off the dribble. To an extent, that's understandable. You're going to find clips of Kawhi Leonard getting beaten off the dribble, and I'm not going to sit here and compare them as prospects. I'm just saying that no matter how good a defender you are, when you're playing against good scores, good scores will score against you now and again. I don't care that he played San Diego or Pepperdine or the bottom of the WCC. He was really good against good opponents. He will be really good in the NBA in a year or two. Do I think that's going to be immediate? No, because the number one thing that takes time for NBA draft dudes is bigs and defense. And when you are outweighed by many guards at the next level, it's going to take some time. I just can't look at a guy who's as smart as he is, who has the instincts that he does, that has the fluidity and the length that he does and say, hey, in two years, this dude won't have figured it out and become a really, really good defender. I, I, I just can't watch his tape and think that. You know, there's a wording you told me a lot at the beginning of this like draft process or a couple months ago. Just don't overthink this guy. <laughs> don't overthink either and it's so students. true it's so true it's so true yeah by the way if i have this right i'm pretty sure you're saying that chet holmgren is Giannis and Kawhi combined <laughs> do i have this well that's total the, jokes total jokes that, no that's the, that's the problem with uh with trying to comp when you're talking about a dude who just has elite skill sets like he's an alien i can't make this comp he is the closest thing i, I can think of defensively is is Mobley, and they have their differences that we've talked about. Well, you know, Gobert. Um, people talk about Gobert, it, it, and I think it. I'm not going to pretend that I watched a ton of Gobert tape when he was in France. I how think dare you? Right, <laughs> um, I think right now I would project that Chet Holmgren's going to be better on the perimeter than Rudy Gobert. Yeah, says a lot, says a lot. So offensively, you know, you kind of hinted the, or do, do you have more defensive notes yeah. before we switch to this? Oh, okay, I guess real quick, defensive fit with Sacramento, unless you have anything. Oh, uh, yeah, let's, let's, we're talking about a dude who I think both of us say, I would like to see him play the four. And, it, and the four meaning that he is playing next to another big man. Um. I think that a lot of the same conversations that everybody had about Evan Mobley last year in terms of, oh, well, he went to Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland's going to trade Jared Allen, right? What happened? Which I never thought that shit would work, to be honest, but it's worked. Oh, so I did. Well. well, okay. No, I didn't think it I, I can't. I'm not, I'm not going to say here that I was sure it was going to work. I said, yeah, let it try. Evan Mobley should be playing next to another big man. Chet Holmgren should be playing up against another big man. I do not want him being the primary dude who has to go out there and stop Joel Embiid or Nikola Jokic or even Giannis. I, I don't want that. I think that Damanis Sabonis is made in a lab to play next to Chet Holmgren. And I hate that I'm saying that because they're both Gonzaga dudes. <laughs> Yes, I can't wait. Let's just get them all. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> I know it's going to happen. And you know what? If if my misery in having to celebrate Gonzaga players is what finally gets Sacramento to put together an elite roster of talent, I will suffer the lamentations of the basketball universe. I will. I don't care. Brian, can we do something right now? If yeah. the Kings get Chet Holmgren, can I buy you a – Chet Holmgren in Zaga jersey. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Hell yes. And I need absolutely. a pic we need a picture on Twitter. It'll be perfect. <laughs> I'm so excited. I uh, I already wanted Chet, but I'm so ready at this point. <laughs> Hell yes. Uh, uh, no, I'll say this. If they yeah, yes, I will absolutely <laughs> have a Chet Holmgren jersey. The first thing I'll do when that not happens. Not a Kings jersey, a Chet Holmgren Gonzaga yeah, 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 yeah. jersey. Yeah, I need okay. a Gonzaga okay. jersey. 
the moment that happens, I'm going to go and buy a St. Mary's jersey because, you know, St. Mary's jerseys are harder to find than Gonzaga jerseys. They, you don't just go down to the student store and buy one of those. They don't have them. I'm sure I'll find one on, on um, China just to wash the stink off. But yeah. the next thing I'll do is go buy a Chet Holmgren Kings jersey because that's how excited I'll be. There we go. So okay. Defensively. Because no, I'm with you that Domas – well, no, defensively real quick. Oh, okay. I'm with you that Domas needs to guard the more physical bigs, the guys, like the guys that you mentioned, as my dog tries to dig to your China jersey. <laughs> um, where I'm uncertain is who's the one guarding the pick and roll? Because it has to be Chet, right? Chet is fuck ridiculous pick and roll defender. Yeah. But then, like, Domas is kind of doing perimeter work, which you don't really want. Like, you make it work. You make it work. I think it yeah. still is an ideal fit. Don't get me wrong. But I think that's where I'm, like, a little, this isn't perfect, you know? <laughs> there, when you have Sabonis, you're not going to find the literal perfect situation for him on defense. That's just not going to exist. The closest you'll get is Chet Holmgren in two years. Very true. Very, very true. Okay. I'm with you. Um, Chet Holmgren, maybe best defensive prospect I've ever seen. Like, he's right there with Mobley. I, think I, I would put Mobley over him, but I, I can see where you're coming from. Yeah. I think I'm wild, but I like really feel like Onyeka and Kongo's just name should just be somewhere in here because yeah. I freaking loved watching him defensively. Oh, yeah. so I'm just going to throw him out there. Um, you know what? You and you and I were the only two people in Sacramento who had him top three that year. Dude, I, I still would give anything. <laughs> I would. If the Kings don't jump to number two and Atlanta is ever thinking about trading him, He's as good a fit next to Sabonis as you can find on the trade market. Yeah. I love it. I'm definitely with you. Yeah. Okay, offensively. Yeah. You mentioned, like, the potential, like, is this guy being underused even? Mm hmm Chet Holmgren was third and barely third, almost fourth, in field goal attempts on this team. Yeah. That's because Drew Temme is a ridiculous college player. He's the focal point here. Drew Temme is the – Drew Timmy is the college Sabonis. It's true. And this is a very good point. I don't know why I didn't think of this. Yes. And, you know, it says something like Chet knew that Drew Timmy was going to be there. He yeah. didn't have to go to Gonzaga and be in that type of role. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Maybe I'm overreading this, but I think there's something of like, you know, you know when you're going there that Drew Timmy's going to be the guy. Well, and even if it's not Drew Timmy, I don't remember. I don't remember when uh, Chet said, "Yeah, I'm going to Gonzaga," and and which came first, Timmy saying, "I'm coming back to Gonzaga," or Chet coming. But same time, like you don't go to Gonzaga expecting that I am going to be the number one option on that team. That said, am I going to sit here and be like, well, couldn't he have uh, had more offensive touches if he went to another blue blood one and done kind of school? No, I think Gonzaga kind of really you underutilized him, especially in the pick and roll. They had the deepest starting rotation or the deepest starting five, I think, that they've had. Now, does that matter that much? No, because just like any other player that you scout, you look for talent and skills, and production is a 2B to that. Um, and I think that chat got to show 99% of what I wanted to on offense. Um, you know, he wasn't just a dude who got his numbers around on the low block in the half court. 47% of his shots are around the basket, and he shot literally, are you ready for this? 80 out of 100. Ooh, 99th percentile. 
Yeah. Um, oh. 35% of his shots in the half court were jumpers, and he shot 36% of them, 36% on them, 68th percentile. Uh, and like you talked about, he had, oh, man, what was the number? How many threes per game? Five point, uh, no, I'm sorry, 3.3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3.3 threes a game. 39%. 39% of them, yeah. He, he's an above average, and that might be underselling, three-point shooter. Yeah, and at seven feet, that's that's great. In the selling point. That's unicorn. Maybe, maybe I'm different with this. Maybe you disagree. Like, the selling point is the, the difference maker is on the defensive end. And the offensive yes. end is starting caliber. Hyper complimentary. Yes. Hyper complimentary third score. With potential to do more. Because yeah. we talked about the three point shooting. Like, I buy him at very much as a three point shooter. And if you're getting that sort of rim protection and length, then there is some aspects of switchability at times, even if maybe that's not his strongest aspect. You're getting elite rim protection. Like, genuinely. It, do you think, like, Chet could, I'm not going to say will, win a defensive player of the year? Uh, I know it's a high bar, but, like, in the conversation? Yes, for yes. sure. Yes. Okay. Like, that is your, to me, that's where I'm looking at Chet, and I'm like, this is where he's making a ginormous difference, and God knows the Kings need that on mm-hmm. the defensive end. And then you're yeah. getting a, a above-average three-point shooter who has moments of being an okay, K passer. I don't. I, 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 I will say, I think that that was one thing that was definitely hidden because one of the things when he was on the prospect um, circuit was that this dude was, I, I don't want to say this name because it implies stuff, a mini Poku I in terms it. of just <laughs> terms of, of uh, the cojones to throw some passes around. It wouldn't surprise me if in in the next level we're like, whoa, where did this passing come from? Um, before before we get into and that's the more- because he's so freaking smart. Like yeah. you see it on the defensive end, it translates to the offense too. Yeah, and another thing that he didn't get to do quite as much at Gonzaga, like incredibly coordinated with the ball in his hands. Uh, when he was in high school, he was the initiator. Um, he's clearly handled the ball a ton over the years. He's ridiculously comfortable with it. He's got a great combination of go-to moves from the driving spin that he showcased at least once a game to uh, a seven-one Dirk fadeaway shot. Like he can grab and go, grab the rebound, go coast to coast, and finish a layup uh, as much as any big man you know, prospect that I'm going to trust. So that all said, I think that you know we'll have the same kind of conversation with him that we do about Jabari, it's not smart to expect that either one of these dudes are a number one in two years. Is it possible? Yes. Because here's a comparison I'm going to just make from now till draft day in terms of one specific aspect of their basketball skill set. He reminds me of Tyrese Halliburton. He's too smart for anybody to put a cap on his ceiling. Yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. They make I'm you kind of offended up. right now. I don't even know how to feel about this. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm oh, well, it's, it's when, cerebral. It's when he's, ridiculous. Uh, when we draft Chet in a couple of months, you'll just have to insult his defense. Chet's uh, going to fall to 12 or fall to 7, <laughs> whatever it is, 8. Uh, that's, that's obviously what's going to happen here. Um, what do you think about his him being the role man? I think when it comes to the Kings, I don't know that we'd see that very much. But, like, we also didn't see it at Gonzaga, so that's why I'm kind of asking. He only had 33 attempts in the pick and roll. Do you think that's that just... it's there? Like, I don't know that – like we said, he he's not one that avoids physicality, but yeah. I also don't view him as a – I wouldn't imagine that he's a very good screen setter. I don't know that he's bad. He's okay. But I he think that that's an aspect be. of, like, I don't know how to feel about him as a role man. He definitely won't be early in his career. Um, I definitely think it's something that a smart coach would try more than he got to a Gonzaga. Like that was Killian Dilly's role. Um, so, which makes it so easy to be like, "This is how it works with Domos." Yeah. When you watch those games. Yeah, I'm. Mean, we're not the only ones thinking about this. Mike Schmidt 
wrote up a very long article about Chet Holmgren. Um, and if anybody didn't see it and has ESPN Plus, go find that article. It's incredibly nuanced. Uh, it it talks about the the strength conversation that you know we kind of brushed off, but is the number one narrative surrounding Chet Holmgren. The Mike Schmitz, as good as you can get in terms of draft prognosticators, said that the best fit for Chet Holmgren is Sacramento with Domas Simonis. So, so that's all that. I needed. That's all yeah. I needed right there. Um, what do you think of his potential to bust? Where are you at with that? Um, because Jabari doesn't have it. Jabari's not a bust guy. If, if I, I it, honestly, to me, the only way that Chet Holmgren busts is if uh, a seven-one dude who's an hundred ninety-six pounds soaking wet comes into the NBA and suddenly he's an injury risk, and suddenly he's getting beaten up and he can't add the requisite strength. And I'm just, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I think that's a possibility. Um, is, is, is if bust is, does he ever get to all star? And no, let's say bust more. is not starter. I I can't look you in the eye and tell you that I see a universe where he is not a starter. I just can't. I'm with you. When Chimezi Metu is your starting four, you can't overthink. <laughs> can't overthink the starter label. <laughs> or or no offense to a dude who I already definitely offended once upon a time on King's Twitter. When Trey Lyles is your starting four, you can't overthink it. You can't. Um, I'm not going to try to do a comparison with Chet. Ceiling of Chet, though, is legit in my mind defensive player of the year and a guy that's shooting 40% from three at the same time. Yeah. The unicorn. Yes. What else could you ask for? Like, is Uh, that not what the Kings need? You know? So, and anybody who, and anybody who wants to have him number one, I fully respect it. That's going to be me right now. I'm going to dive deeper into Apollo. You're locking it in? I'm going to dive deeper into Apollo. Uh, I'm kind of like bitching out here. I, I, at a point where it's like I still feel like I have so much more to watch with all these guys, and even these two, like, watched a lot leading up to this and this week, but I'm still have – I haven't caught every game yet. Like, and these are guys that are at the very top. Like, I'm not saying I'm going to get to every single game. I was going to say, but, holy yeah. cow. That's <laughs> a commitment. There's now. still definitely more that I'll end up watching. Yeah. Um, as I watch some of these later guys, it's like, oh, this one happens to be against Auburn. I'll throw this one on, you know. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I'm kind of – the dude, being... one of the dudes we're watching next week. Exactly. Um, so maybe I'm being a little bit of a puss because I don't want to lock anything in yet. I mainly want to wait to do more Paulo research and have more strong takes on that. Between the two of Chet and Jabari, I know that I'm putting Chet first. And to me, and I think that you're the opposite, so I guess we can each give our sides here. I... Yeah, I'm going to put Jabari. I'm going to put Jabari number one. Because I think the the version of Chet who's really going to help this team is further down the road than the than the than Jabari. Jabari comes in and he helps this team immediately. Yeah. Chet comes in and he makes a difference immediately. I don't know that he is a locked in starter day one. I think that Jabari comes in and he is immediately the best shooter that this team has seen since. Since, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, I legitimately Jamal. blanked Buddy Healed out of my mind for a minute there. How I was like, you? boy, is it Kevin wow. Martin? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, yeah, yeah. The, he's the best bigger than six nine shooter that this team has seen since Pedro Stoyakovic. Yes. There we go. Very much so. Where I'll go with Chet is to me. I'm with you. Jabari instantly fits on this team. Jabari is a dream. Jabari is the guy that, like, you're wanting to go and trade for this offseason, you know, to make a difference immediately going into next year. Where I'm at with Chet, and the reason I'm willing to be more patient, is the ceiling's different to me. 
I think that Jabari has the ceiling, like, but, you know, I, I think kind of the way I do this is like, there's a floor, there's a ceiling and there's like a, how much do I believe that either one of those is the most realistic in Jabari? It's not too, it's not all that wide of a range. It's a high floor. It's actually a really high ceiling, but I'm skeptical that he reaches that ceiling. There's needs to be an outlier progression to me in that handle and the finishing yes. come with it. Which if that happens, like, then I'm going to start to, again, lazy comp, entertain these Jason Tatum shit a little bit. <laughs> um, but, yeah, again, lazy comp there. But with Chet, to me, like, I just, there's the flashes of everything, you know? And it's going to take time. It's going to be more raw. But if you just see progress, like, where you're – the eight or nine seed next year and maybe you win one play in but you lose the second like i'm fine with that progress if i'm able to look at next year the year after and be like yeah but we have fucking chet holmgren Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it's still an improvement over what you mentioned chemezi metu mo harkless trey lyles like i get that that's a low bar but to me it's still improving the team next year maybe it's not drastically but it is still an improvement Enough where I'm okay with marginal improvement next year. If, like, to me, year two or year three, you're going to see some breakout of maybe this guy can be better than De'Aaron or Domas. And I just don't know that I'm quite there with Jabari. Although, again, it it could be the case. I just know there's not enough of, like, the flashes of where I want to see the improvement. I'm not complaining with either pick, though. Don't get me wrong. If the Kings get a top two pick in this class they're getting a dude who's going to change the trajectory of their franchise. And I will include Paulo Bancaro in that. Yeah. It's just a little messier. And Tim Maxwell will include Keegan Murray. <laughs> Tim Maxwell is, is driving all the way up from Arizona to make sure that <laughs> one of us mentions Keegan Murray before the end of this podcast. I do really, really like Keegan Murray. And I'm pretty sure you do too, right? Oh, oh, I know we're not right. playing him. I'm just not putting him in a in no, Chet no, Jabari no. or anything, which I no. know we're not just kind of tongue in cheek here, but yeah. He's uh, it's, uh, tier two or three for me. I haven't really decided which. Yeah. Which, by the way, I asked Monty about his draft philosophy. I'm not going to oh. play the clip in this one because I don't know that it relates all too much to these two prospects. But I think, like, it's probably going to come up when we talk about AJ Griffin. It's yeah. definitely going to come up when we talk about AJ Griffin. It's definitely going to come up. <laughs> yeah, um, your 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 clip there uh, ended my AJ Griffin hope for. Uh, Mon- Monty says a lot of nothing though, dude. Like I, it's yeah. it's hard to gauge because it's, at first I'm like I think he accidentally gave some like I think that I get what you're saying here, but at the same time I know that you're not trying to say that. So yeah, anyway, but the that's clip how is he's drafted. Team. That is yeah. how he's drafted. He's just drafted two dudes. Yeah, he's drafted two dudes who immediately made impacts. Actually, this route runs to uh, a point I'd like to make to end the podcast. Um, I am going to eat a whole bunch of crow here. As we head into this draft cycle, I'm finding myself in a really odd place. I haven't loved every move that Monty McNair has made in his tenure, but at least as the draft is concerned, I'm not worried about the Kings draft evaluation, at least not in the first round. And a lot of that trust has been gained over the last month and a half as I've watched Davion Mitchell, who, as listeners know, I was not really high on last year. Even a month and a half ago, I wasn't really high on. His end of this season his growth as a playmaker and as a driving scorer, his omnipresent tenacity on defense. It's just won me over to the idea that he was a right pick, even if he wasn't and still may not be the pick I wanted Nick Nair to make. Brian um, hates Moses Moody. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's just, it's more like it. I. It's hard to call it the wrong pick. It's hard to call it a wrong pick. Um, I'll, I'm just going to happily eat ginormous helpings of crows for all my concerns about Mitchell last summer. And that's just two for two on solid number one selections for Monty. So 
heading into the draft season, I find myself not worried about the Sacramento Kings making draft evaluations. If they and get the, the next Robert first Woodard, time in a while. If they get the next Robert Woodard, Bryant, let's fucking do this, man. I'm so ready <laughs> to get so hyped on these second rounders again. Oh, well, the good thing for you is that the Robert Woodard in this class is the dude we're going to be talking about next time, and he's not going to bust in a year. Mm, mm, interesting. How dare you? Robert Woodard is still in the process. This is coming around. What are you talking about here? Um, <laughs> any final thoughts on Jabari Smith Jr. and, and Chet Holmgren, Bryant? Don't overthink either of them. Yep. I'm with you. And it'd be a fucking dream to get either one of these guys. If yeah. the Kings are number one, I'm not upset at taking either one of these picks. Yep. And if they're sitting two, three, four, I'm so happy running home with that. I will fly to China and get Bryant as many Gonzaga jerseys as I want. I am so can. looking forward to that. <laughs> I thought I already wanted Chet beforehand, but <laughs> even more so now. Um, uh. All right. Apparently, there's some craziness going on outside my window. I'm not sure if that's it's, getting your me, dog is like, busted out of the house. My dog has uh, very much destroyed. Let's see if uh, I can show the YouTube channel what's going on here. Destroyed something right here. <laughs> your basketball uh, ball, your basketball pillow. Yeah, she's she's definitely chewing on a wicker basket and pretending like I can't see her right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, destroyed something over there. So. Uh, your yes. dog of uh, your dog of of uh, fame of all of the uh, shows you did today. Yeah, apparently, and I swear she never sat right there. Anybody watching on YouTube, she never sits right there. But since I moved my camera here, she thinks that it's just her moment. So all of a sudden, this is a thing. Um, all right, Brian, I think that's all I got, man. So. I think that we're going to get out of here. We're going to keep up these draft profiles. I love doing this draft stuff. I'm so happy to be back in this cycle, especially doing it with you, my guy. And I think this is going to be a weekly thing if we're able to keep up with that. I know we both got a lot going on, but that is the plan here. So we'll see how that goes. And there's going to be plenty of work. I, profiles for myself and I would assume from you as well throughout oh, the yeah. cycle. Oh, Yeah. Um, eventually um and plenty of amazing work in between those from all the guys and gals at the king's herald amazing group of people obviously so check out that site and the patreon there to support local independent king's coverage and if you enjoyed this episode of the king's pulse podcast please subscribe rate and review and you'll hear from us again in the next couple of days